I've oiled my chair because last week apparently it was very squeaky. You know, we have to do these things. So let's see if you can squeak free chairs. <laughs> no expense spared at St. Michael's. Fantastic. Excellent. So how are we getting on with this sermon series? I've been really enjoying it. I think it's brilliant just to get our heads a little bit around well, what is church about? What are we trying to do with church and the different elements of church? And I've spoken on life groups. For those of you who don't know, life groups are um, weekday groups that meet either in the day or in the evening, once a week or every other week. We've got about 25 life groups in St. Michael's Church. They're a wonderful way of gathering. So I'm going to speak a little bit about that this morning. And it's one of my favorite topics, and I've spoken about it a couple of times. Um, I've, I've been here two years, and so I have talked about it, and I really I love this topic. But one of the things I'm never quite sure is, is, is it sinking in? I mean, the stuff that we say from the front, we never quite know whether it actually is sinking in. And I used to be a teacher for 15 years, and one of the things as a teacher we would do in order to work out whether things were sinking in is we would... Um, we would have exams and tests. And it, it, it surprises me that we don't employ that in church. You know, I think we should introduce, you know, at the end of a sermon series, a bit of a little, a little exam. We'll call it a test so it doesn't feel so weighty. And you can bring a little teddy bear and put it on your, you know, on your desk and your see-through pencil case, which is, for those of you who don't know, you have to bring in a see-through pencil case. And we're all socially distanced, so no one will be able to cheat. Let's do that in the autumn. Let's not do that, okay? I'm looking at your faces. I'm assuming from behind your mask that you're really thinking that is a bad idea. But I have spoken about life groups, and, um, and I've used a few images um, over the months. As, um, can we have the pictures of those three images up? And I wonder whether you know those images. I've spoken about them. I wonder whether, if I was to give you a test, don't worry, it's not going to happen, would you be able to say one thing about one of those pictures about our life groups? I hope you would. We're going to look at the, 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 the Rublev again a little bit later on in, our, um, in the preach. The giant redwood trees exist. Why? Sorry, why are they connected to life groups? Can someone shout out? Ollie's doing a mime. Roots, yes. They only exist with each other. They can't grow that high without being enmeshed. Their roots are only 12 feet deep. Can you believe it? 12 feet. And, they, and yet they go so high. We are learning and we are growing together. And the geese, geese honk at each other as they fly in formation. There's all sorts of things I could say about geese. Um, but I, I'm not going to for this. <laughs> um, but they honk at each other to encourage each other. Anyway, did you know that uh, people, I'm reminded of this statistic this week, people in a congregation listening to a sermon only remember 7% of the sermon. And I've wasted 3% talking about tests and exams. So I'm really going to make sure that I, I'm going to um, hopefully get the other stuff in. Why is life groups really important? Why do we major on it? Why is it so key? Because our discipleship, our apprenticeship to Jesus, can only take place in relationship. We can't do it on our own. It can only happen in relationship. And we are relational creatures. I love this quotation from Ronald Rollheiser. Um, it says this. It should come up on the page. Here it is. At the core of our being is this truth. We are designed for and defined by our relationships. We were born with a relentless longing to participate in the lives of others. Fundamentally, we are relational souls. We cannot not be relational. And that is why the last 15 months have been so painful, haven't they? Because we are at our very core relational creatures. God designed that. He set that design within us. And he, he goes on to say that loneliness is, our, is a proof of our relational design, the fact that we feel lonely. And our nation, our culture, our world is increasingly becoming a lonely place. Mother Teresa said, loneliness is the leprosy of our modern age. And we, in our, in our nation, we, did you know we have a government minister for loneliness? Teresa May set that up. Because there is a need for it. My goodness, there is a need for it. And our life groups 
combat something of that in the life of our church. So, to this passage, Acts 2, it's, we're post-Pentecost, pe- the Holy Spirit has come, and we're into the honeymoon period of the early church. And so we get a picture of these apprentices of Jesus, a life group, if you like, interdependent, interconnected, living in relationship with God and each other. And it is a picture of learning and growing. And I'm just going to touch on very briefly just five little points from this passage that I think gives us a reason why life groups, in the way that we do them and other churches around the world do them, are a perfect way of expressing Our discipleship, expressing God's love and enabling us to learn, grow, share Jesus and serve together. Okay, so this passage, as it says, Acts 2, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And I love that word, devoted there. That word means steadfastly continuing. So they, it's the long haul. It isn't something that we can do in a minute or a month. It's something that is a slow, long haul. It is the discipleship in one direction. It is a slow journey in discipleship. And my favorite word is in that first sentence here, and it is in fellowship. So they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to fellowship. Fellowship. That word fellowship, if we can have slide four, that word fellowship is the word koinonia. Koinonia. And it is an absolutely fabulous word. And we need to understand it if we need to understand the vision behind life groups and church as we understand it, the family of God. Because it means fellowship. It means communion. It means union. It means in oneness. And for many people, life groups over the last 15 months have been real lifesavers, haven't they? If you're a member of a life group, you will, I'm sure, and I hope that you will have felt engaged and connected with the life of our church family, even though we've not been able to meet very much over the last 15 months because of the koinonia of our life groups. This week, uh, we're a member of a life group, and this week, my, my youngest son, Rafi, broke his leg on Monday on a trampoline underneath his slightly older brother. <laughs> and it was sad. And then two days later, can you believe it, another family in our life group, another boy broke his leg. So two broken legs in one life group in the space of three days. Lord, one of my kids said, Daddy, I think we need to pray. (laughs) Yes, we really did need to pray. And what we received from our life group texts and WhatsApp messages and sweets, and and I know the other family, people went and they took clothes to the hospital and the coin and ear, that is what it is. The fellowship, the fellowship of believers gathering and loving each other. And that is what we participate in. And this word koinonia, there's even a little bit more, of, more to it. Um, and if we could have the picture of the, the Rublev paintings, a bit squished. I'm sorry about that. Rublev didn't squish it, I'm pretty sure. But here we have the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gathered around a table. You notice the little chalice of wine in front of them. And I think this is a picture of a, of a life group. <laughs> It, it is a koinonia. It is the fellowship of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in this picture, it's quite famous, and you'll probably notice there's a gap between um, the two near to us. And that gap is the invitation to all of us to come and be in and, and be part of the koinonia of the Holy Spirit. And so our life groups reflect something and participate in, in some mystical way, in the very picture and personality of the Holy Trinity. Does that make sense? It's, it's incredible. So when we do life in our life groups, we are sort of reflecting something of the Holy Spirit and, and the Father and the Son, accommodating all our knobbly bits. <laughs> which uh, Vicky made reference to um, from a Milton Jones quote. Because they're different, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet one. And we, as we gather in life group, we are all different with knobbly bits, and yet in some extraordinary way, we are one as a life group, in as much as we are one as a church, one body. 
So, coin and ear, beautiful word. The second one, I'm going to go much quicker over these next three. The second one is we learn and we grow in the word. We'll, you'll notice as we meet together in life groups is we learn to love scripture. We learn to, to read it together. We learn to understand and to decode it together. And that is part of our discipleship of learning and growing together. And then slide seven, learning and growing in prayer together. And it says, we, um, the, the, in, in Acts, it says to break, to the, they were devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and prayer. Absolutely. Prayer is the, um, it is the engine room of our church. It is the engine room of our life groups. And it should be and is, hopefully, the engine room of our own lives. And there we learn how to pray together. We learn, perhaps tentatively, how to speak out prayers in our life group. We learn what it means to do prophetic prayer. We learn what it means to do intercessory prayer. We learn what it is to perhaps speak in tongues as well. That is a form of prayer. So we, we learn and we grow in prayer in our life groups, devoted. And then the next one... Um, it, we learn and grow in ministry. Learning and growing in ministry. What is ministry? Ministry just means service. It means serving. Can you see there? Serving together. That is our ministry. So when you come to your life group, if you join a life group, then it isn't, you're not just receiving the ministry of the life group leaders. No, no, no. This is an opportunity for you to serve and be, participate in your ministry in your life group. We share each other's gifts. And it's fun. I really want life groups to be fun. I think this, the last 15 months, it's sort of sucked the fun out of a lot of things, hasn't it? No singing, no dancing, no whatever. But we in life groups, we need to have fun together, eat together, drink wine together, worship together. It says in the passage, they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. That sounds fun, doesn't it? We can forget. We sometimes think that intensity is a fruit of the Spirit. It is not. Intensity is not a fruit of the Spirit. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. So let's play games and let's have fun in our life groups. And it's opposed. I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I can feel um, a little bit when life group comes is, oh, I'm not sure I've got the energy or mm, there's something else that I need to do. And perhaps there's, there's a voice that we can listen to, which is, oh, you won't be noticed if you don't go. I think I would say that that voice is a lie. <laughs> Life groups are fundamentally important to our flourishing as Christians. And therefore, the enemy of our souls, the enemy, the prince of this world, he does not want us to go along to life groups. He does not want us to learn and grow together, to serve together. He absolutely does not. And so he will do everything in order to prevent you from going. So let's not listen to that lie. Let's listen to the truth of the Holy Spirit that says, you are crucial. You, each of us, are crucial to the koinonia of your group. The Holy Spirit who says, I'm going to use your gifts to bless and heal others in the group. The Holy Spirit who says, I'm going to heal and transform you into my likeness as you minister to this group. It's not just the life group leaders. It is all of us that bring our gifts in ministry. And my final fifth point is we, are, we learn and we grow in mission. And that is... That, that, that stirred and stimulated in life groups. Now, it can happen in all sorts of ways. It doesn't have to be in a life group. But we set up this structure within the life of the church in order to facilitate these things. It says um, in slide 10, the scripture that's coming up, it says, And the Lord added to their number. This is the, right at the end of the passage. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved added to their number daily. And I love this verse. Let's keep it up for a bit. Because this single line gives us a wonderful insight into God's mission for us as a church, for all churches, for all Christians. It gives us a fancy word, missiology. 
a sort of theology for mission and multiplication. Because if you look at it, notice who is doing, who, who, notice who's the subject of this sentence. It's not us. It's definitely not me who's in charge of life groups. Few. The Lord added to their number and those who were being saved. Daily, those who were being saved. The Lord. It is his mission and we create the conditions for him to do that. It's not to say that we're off the hook and we don't need to ask anyone to come to life group or come to church because what, by not asking people, we are, they are missing out on the coin and ear that we have. The fellowship and all the sweetness that comes with it. And by sticking around in our life groups in a bit of a holy huddle, we don't really want to grow because there's no room in our, in our, in our living room. Or we, we, there's, there's room in, on Zoom so we won't meet together. What we're doing is we're sort of saying, budge up, let's not allow anyone else to join the coin and ear. And as soon as we have that thought, I think we stop being a fellowship. Does that make sense? We actually, it, we stop being a fellowship because we stop reflecting the, the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and others are welcome to come in. Welcome, welcome. Remember what Rob said, what I love about church is the welcome. It's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and there's room at the table. Come and sit down and have fellowship. That is the great invitation for us all. The Lord added to, his num to, to, um, to their number. And it's partly why as a, as a church we're thinking and as core leaders we've been thinking about what does it look like to create the conditions um, and to invite life group leaders and life groups to think about what is multiplication, what might it look like for us in the autumn and moving ahead? What might that look like? And if there's a resistance in you, perhaps the Holy Spirit might just well, uh, you ask, Lord, what's going on in me that I'm resisting that? What would multiplication look like in the bigger groups? And I'm using multiplication, not dividing and breaking up, or none, that's not kingdom language. Multiplying. So others, so there's space for others to, to share the coin and ear of these beautiful groups. Okay, coming into land. You see, when we learn and grow in fellowship, coin and ear, we become more missional. When we learn and grow in the words, understand the Bible, we become more missional. When we learn and grow in prayer, we develop the heart of mission. And when we learn and grow in ministry, God gives us the tools so that we can be more missional. Amazing. I'm going to end on one final point. And then um, the band will come up and they're going to, to lead us in um, another song. In fact, band, why don't you come up while I, while, while I end in a final point. In Acts 2, we're right at the beginning of the early church and we get a glimpse of the honeymoon period of the early church. It would be wrong of us to think that that is the perfect picture and the early church were able to sustain that perfect picture of ministry and devotion to word and sharing all their stuff. Because you only need to look, read a few chapters later to realize that they got a lot, of, a lot wrong. There was a lot, of, um, there was a lot of disagreement. There needed reconciliation. There needed, um, you know, there was division over theology. There was breakdown of communication. And the reason why I say that is I think we need to move into the future with our life groups, with a, with a mindset that is encapsulated in this quotation from Henri Nouwen. Because he said this, learn to forgive each other for not being God. Learn to forgive each other for not being God. Isn't that, isn't that extraordinary? You see, no human, none of us, can live up to our expectations. Only God can. No life group, no life group leader can fulfill yours and my needs. And we all sin, and we all bump up against each other, and we need to learn how to forgive each other for not being God to us, for not for fulfilling all that we're hoping for, 
What are we hopeful? We want our wounds bound and healed. We want to be seen. We want to be known. We want to be loved unconditionally. And these are not bad things in and of themselves. Of course not. Those are human needs. But ultimately, as humans, we carry sin around with us. We need to learn what does it look like to forgive each other in our koinonia. Because if we don't, then the koinonia breaks down. <laughs> and... Um, and we, and we can't grow. So I wonder what this morning, what landed with you this morning? What is it that, uh, that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this morning about fellowship? Maybe you long to be in fellowship and you're not. Maybe you long to be part of that unity and that union of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And someone can pray for you this morning to, to be invited in to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is what me, it means to be a Christian, is to recognize your sin and come forward and, and, and be part of the, um, the, the family of God. Perhaps it's about the Bible. Perhaps it's about prayer. Perhaps it's about sharing your gifts. Perhaps it's about a resistance to mission. Whatever it is, I think God wants to do a work this morning. Shall we stand up? Let's stand together. Why don't you just take one aspect of that I've um, talked about that has struck you. Maybe it's about forgiveness. Learn to forgive each other for not being God. Father, we long to be a people. We long to learn and grow in fellowship, in koinonia. Help us to move towards each other, be courageous in our conversations, in our willingness to open our lives and say the things that we wouldn't normally say. Help us to be an honest people with each other of what's going on in our lives. Give us courage in that area, Lord. And Father, help us to learn and to grow in our gifts. I think there's one or two people here, you, you've got a gift and you're not, you're not quite ready or you don't feel ready to step out and go, I'd like to use this. And I wonder whether now is the time to go, no, I've got a gift. I want to learn and grow in my ministry, in my service. And maybe there's some, some of you who are like, I'd love to join a life group. I'd love to join this and come and speak to me afterwards or go to the website. It's very easy. Join a life group. There's a whole list of life groups there and you just sign up and the email comes to me anyway and I'll have a chat with you. But please, welcome to these fellowships because they're, it's there that there is life, there that there is hope, there that there is we encounter Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the fellowship of God. So Lord, we lift all these things up to you in your holy, heavenly